This is our work environment in the back of an ambulance, which is limited. What we do isn't in the ER. It's not in a nice, clean environment. Sometimes we're in fields, sometimes we're in mud, sometimes we're just out. We bounce down the road, we're never still. The first idea of ultrasound and EMS was brought to me by Jason Bowman. Most EMS systems that use ultrasound, they save it for trauma. For the city of Keller, we don't run much trauma. We talked about the medical uses of it and how we could add in all the extra things that they do in the ER. It's not commonly done in EMS. The most valuable one we've been using it for is cardiac examinations for our hypotensive patients, because before we just knew, okay, they're in shock, and we could look at a few small things to try to tell what was going on. But with ultrasound, we could tell this is cardiogenic shock, this is septic shock, this is uh, hypovolemia. We can tell exactly what's going on. There's no wasting time. And we've used it to check for pneumothoraxes. We've used it to check for triple A's. One of the better things I think that I've used it for is starting IVs. We had a patient who was, like we say, if somebody's doing very bad, they're circling the drain. A lot of things have to happen very fast access for medications to be given is one of our priorities. So on this patient, there were no visible vessels to be able to start an IV on. I grabbed the ultrasound machine and told one of our other paramedics to grab the drill, and we'll see who gets one of them faster. We would much rather have an intravenous line than an intraosseous line in the bone because they run better, they're easier to push drugs through, and they just work better. I actually ended up beating him in getting that IV and being able to give treatment to that patient faster, which was very impressive to me. I believe that this is the next thing that will help us to do our job better. We've already pretty well mandated it where you have to have it available in the emergency room. I think it should be the same in the ambulance. You make a difference in one patient's life and one patient's outcome, and it's worth all the work. That's what sold me, and that should sell anybody else. Hi, my name is Jason Bowman, and I'm here to talk to you today about EMS point of care ultrasound. This is the beginning of a multi-part series on pre-hospital ultrasound. Over the course of this series, I intend to pass along the lessons that I learned running my own program to hopefully relieve some of the headaches of starting errors. Today in part one, we'll discuss briefly an introduction to pre-hospital ultrasound, and I'll also go over how to perform a FAST exam. But be sure to listen all the way to the end, where I discuss the most important part, how to interpret the data from your FAST exam, and why it may not be the best exam to start with when launching your own ultrasound program. Let's get started. What exactly is ultrasound? Ultrasound is made up of high frequency sound waves, similar to a depth finder on a boat, but much nicer. Fortunately for my friend here, ultrasound is incredibly safe. Safe enough to put to your head without damaging anything important. Similar to a depth finder, ultrasound doesn't work out of water, which is why we use coupling gel between the probe and the patient. There are lots of little intricacies like this that we'll discuss as they arise, so don't fret too much over the details. I'm sure what you really want to know is how ultrasound can help you treat your patients. And that is exactly what we'll be discussing for the rest of this series. How is a test useful in medicine? You could use fancy things like sensitivity, specificity, PPV, NPV, get into pretest probabilities, but a simpler test can do just fine. Does anything that I want to try out make my job easier? Does it do something I couldn't do before? Does it make something I already do safer? So applying these rules to the stethoscope and determining the need for, say, a needle decompression in the ambulance, does a stethoscope make ID of attention pneumothorax any easier? In an ambulance, I'd beg that no. It doesn't help that much, because you can't hear anything over the sound of a diesel engine, and when you can't hear anything to begin with, how do you look for the absence of something? Really, the stethoscope makes it more complicated, because it can be so ambiguous. I've spent many a transport listening for breath sounds, stressing about if I should dart a chest or not. It may sound silly now, but when you're on the fence, it can be nerve-wracking at the time. There are many an ER physician that can tell you a story about a stable appearing patient with breast sounds, clear times four, only to have a frantic radiologist call back with a chest x-ray showing a massive, potentially tension pneumo. So could I identify a tension pneumo without a stethoscope? Yes, actually. I've darted many chests. None of them were for stethoscope findings. What's the first thing you think about whenever a trauma patient arrests minutes after you intubate them? A tension pneumothorax, of course. You don't need a stethoscope to find this. Does the addition of a stethoscope make identifying a pneumo any safer? In 2010, Michael Blavis found that 26% of the patients brought in by EMS who received needle decompression never had a pneumothorax to begin with. 
By making it more complicated and often providing ambiguous answers, it can actually make it more dangerous. It even distracts us from looking where other more objective markers like unequal chest rise could be found. Let's apply these same rules to ultrasound. Does ultrasound make identification of attention pneumothorax easier? Uh, yes, uh, attention pneumo can be identified in multiple ways using ultrasound, and many of them have been shown to be easy to perform and interpret. The PEEP study even showed a 93.1% one-week post-test success in identification of pneumothorax, effusions, and cardiac standstill. And this was with, even with an evenly mixed group of medics, basics, and students. So does this allow me to identify more pneumothoraxes than without it? Uh, Negroshev showed an 82% sensitivity for ultrasound versus only a 32% sensitivity for chest x-ray, which is often the first thing that many ER physicians will go for. I mean, the only thing that's better than ultrasound in this study was CT scan. You could even go so far as to find the edge of a pneumo, it's called the lung point, and trace it out with a sharpie. Then as long as the patient is in the same position, you could go back later and see if it got any bigger or smaller. This is not something you'd actually ever do in an ambulance, but that just shows you how accurate it is. Something a little more useful, however, is that ultrasound can even measure the depth of tissue that you have to penetrate to reach the pleural space, and tell you if your needle is long enough to begin with. And this is a common problem in needle decompression, especially when using just an angiocap to do this. Ultrasound can tell you if your needle is in the pleural space, and then you can go back and tell if it's successfully decompressed the tension pneumo or not. None of these things can be done by any other means currently available in the ambulance. By visualizing it, ultrasound actually makes identifying the presence or absence of a pneumo safer and more confident. By reducing the uncertainty, it reduces the time to diagnosis and the stress of doing this as well. By definitively saying the patient does not currently have at least a large pneumothorax, you can avert a needless chest arc, which regardless of the Blavis study, if it's long enough to penetrate the chest wall, it generally buys the patient a chest tube when they get to the hospital. And when absent, it allows you to focus on other problems the patient may have, potentially with further ultrasound examinations. I'm sure you've been watching the clip playing in the background while I've been talking, and you're probably wondering exactly what is this. Well, the top of the image is the surface near the probe. The bottom is deeper into the patient, close to the lungs. On either side of the image are ribs. The sound waves can't penetrate them, so they cast a dark shadow beneath them. The top half of the image is the patient's chest wall. The bottom half is actually nothing because it's been destroyed by air. There's air in this image because the white moving line is actually the surface of the lung. And since the lung is full of air, it destroys the image of anything but the surface of it. Uh, this movement of the lung surface against the chest wall is uh, called sliding lung sign. Those streaky things shooting down are small but natural consolidations of alveoli that on ultrasound we call comet tails. You and I most likely have them right now. If you see comet tails, you are guaranteed that the patient does not have a pneumothorax. This exam is performed in the second to third intercostal space, midclavicular, which may sound like a familiar place to put a needle, doesn't it? So how about this one? We've got ribs on either side of the screen, so we're in the appropriate orientation, just like the last one. And we can see a bright white line right in the middle, so we're at the appropriate depth. But where's the saliva lung sign? Do you see any comatels? That's because this patient's lung is not actually touching their chest wall. There's a layer of air between the chest wall and the lung, which destroys the image. You may think that you would see something like black or white, and then you'd see a lung. But unfortunately, no. As air destroys the image, it just comes back as static. So we have to look for that sliding lung, and we have to look for those comatels like I talked about before. Uh, there's also multiple, multiple other ways and techniques we could use to identify how large the pneumothorax is and to verify those findings. And we'll discuss many of those in part two when we go over the rush exam. So for now, rest assured, this patient has a pneumothorax, and if they're clinically decompensating, this is a free license to stick a needle in their chest. Just be sure to use your depth markers, which aren't seen in this video but are on the actual images. They would be off to the right of the screen. Uh, use your depth markers to make sure that your needle can actually reach the pleural space, and then go back and check with ultrasound that your decompression was successful, because, yeah, you can do that. So that's all pretty cool. But the big question we often get is, can paramedics use ultrasound? Yes. Yes, they can. Even the stethoscope was met with concern over its difficulty, and in some ways, it's difficult to use just to this day. Many of us were often told to go out and buy one and start using it without any formal training. Uh... Honestly, that was how I started as a paramedic. I was told to buy one for my first rotation and never shown even how to use it. Ironically, if we were all handed ultrasound machines and told to do the same, we'd probably be better off. At least for me, it's a lot easier to figure out what I'm looking at than it is what I'm listening to. But the argument of stethoscope versus ultrasound is a completely unnecessary one. The two of them can and should be used in tandem. Ultrasound should be used to augment your exam. In EMS, ultrasound should be part of the secondary exam. You can use your clinical acumen and traditional skills to create a working diagnosis to initiate your treatment using your protocols.
Then go back with your ultrasound and confirm your diagnosis. You may be surprised when you do this. There were quite a few times when we were. And even for doctors, it's not that uncommon. There was a 2015 study out of UCLA in critical care medicine where they looked at patients with systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury after an initial fluid resuscitation who lacked an obvious source of hypotension. These were ER docs, but they were using a structured ultrasound protocol that would be well within the grasp of VMS ultrasonography. In the study, they found some surprising results. The initial ultrasound reduced diagnostic uncertainty by 27.7%, increased the absolute proportion of patients with a definitive diagnosis from 0.8 to 12.7%. 24.6% of them had a significant change in the use of IV fluids, vasoactive agents, or blood products. There was also a significant change in major diagnostic imaging, consultation, and emergency department disposition. Honestly, these results are pretty huge. We did a similar but smaller study in our EMS agencies. Ultrasound was used every 12.5 runs, which for us worked out to once every busy shift or once every other normal shift on our slower days. Mind you, this was before we gained the ability to do IVs and many of the other unique things that we've started to do later on. This was just the basic ultrasound exam. Even so, we had major clinical findings that changed patient care on every fourth ultrasound exam that we did. This worked out to a number needed to treat of about 46. Mind you, this is roughly equivalent to aspirin in a heart attack, which carries a number needed to treat of 42. Even with our limited exams and the much more expensive machines of 2009, we worked out the cost to be about $15 per exam. With today's newer generation, less expensive machines, you're looking at roughly half that, and even less if you're starting to do more advanced ultrasound exams than we were doing. Bottom line, using ultrasound will change your pre-hospital clinical practice. The way that we are able to do ultrasound in an ambulance without going through years of school like a sonographer is because we don't perform the same kind of examination. In emergency medicine, and by extension EMS, we do not perform diagnostic sonography. We perform focused ultrasound exams. The difference is that diagnostic sonography looks for anything that could be wrong with an organ. For example, a sonographer might approach an ultrasound case thinking, can I see anything wrong with this patient's right upper quadrant? Focused sonography, on the other hand, tries to answer a small set of clinical questions like, is there free fluid around the patient's liver? which is a much less daunting task. The bar for training is so much less that in focus sonography, after a 15 minute class, even eighth graders could not only do it, but then could turn around and successfully teach it as well to more eighth graders. And if any eighth grader can do it, then with a significant investment in quality upfront training and continual education, some firefighters might be able to do it as well. So what exactly can ultrasound do for you? There's a ton of things ultrasound can do for EMS. And we'll talk about those as we move forward in the upcoming sessions. But today we're going to focus on the FAST exam, which stands for Focused Assessment with Sonography for Trauma. This exam, in many ways, was the birthplace of both emergency and pre-hospital ultrasound, and for better or worse, is all that many agencies use their machines for. To do all of these exams, though, we need to understand our equipment. In EMS point-of-care ultrasound, we've got three probes that we commonly use. You may not have them all, but you should at least know what they are. First off is the linear probe. This is the featherweight champion here. Super high frequency means it's super fast. High quality images, but not a lot of penetration. Great for IVs, looking at finding fine details like the surface of the lung sliding, and things like nerves, tendons, musculoskeletal exams, stuff like this. Next up is the phased array. It's a middleweight workhorse of the group. Uh, if you've just got one probe, this had better be it. This guy can do just about anything except for starting IVs. With a small footprint, can squeeze between ribs and all but eliminate a rib shadow. But that small footprint comes with a price. This probe uses software trickery to make up for less crystals actually touching the skin. This means the image quality is far less than the other two probes. Speaking of the other probe, the biggest one we have is the curved array. This has got a ton of crystals on this one. Uh, great image quality and penetration, which is perfect for looking at the abdomen, checking for lung physiology deep into the lung. Uh, it can certainly look at the heart, but the problem is that trying to squeeze this thing under somebody's sternum can count as painful stimuli. And if you go above the ribs, be ready to look through some blinds, because all that real estate means you're going to have multiple rib shadows to contend with. If you can handle that, though, it'll give you about the best quality picture you can get. This is what we started with in our service, so I may sound a little derogatory to it, but trust me, it'll work. Uh, take a moment to notice the image shapes, too, uh, created by the three different probes. The linear probe has a flat surface with a straight down view. The curved array probe has got a curved surface, and then it fans out. And then the faced array probe, it narrows down to a point and then fans out as well. Um, keep these small details in mind as we're going forward. It will help you identify what kind of image you're looking at.
The fast exam is made up of a series of views. These views are obtained by looking through sonographic windows, which are locations and orientations with which we place the probe on the patient's body. Don't worry if this sounds overly complicated, I've got plenty of pictures to show you coming up soon. The primary views that we care about are the cardiac, the right upper quadrant view, sometimes called Morrison's pouch, the left upper quadrant view, and the suprapubic view. We'll save the sliding lung sign or the extended fast view for the rush exam lecture coming up later, as it's often not included in a traditional fast exam. So let's go over some of the on-screen anatomy that you'll be looking at. Starting on the left of the screen, we have the parasternal long axis view. This is your go-to view for starting the exam. We'll go over probe placement in a moment, so let's just talk about the image anatomy for now. The right ventricle is on top in both views. This is because the right ventricle is the most inferior and anterior of the two ventricles. Uh, the right ventricle should not take up more than about 40% of the total heart size. This is one of the first things that we're going to be looking for. Working our way down, the left ventricle is just beneath it and is separated by the intraventricular septum. Just deep to that is the bright white line of the pericardium. And then finally, you'll see the descending thoracic aorta outside the pericardium. This landmark is not always identified, but fortunately it's easier to see if there's an effusion, as it helps you distinguish whether the fluid is inside the pericardium or outside of it in the chest. Off to the right of the image, we can see the aortic outflow tract and the aortic valve in the middle, and the left atria just below with the mitral valve towards the center of the image. Now a quick word on image orientation. Radiologists like to view their patients from the foot of the bed, but for some reason, cardiologists do it from the head of the bed. This doesn't sound like it's too much of a big deal, except that it's going to depend on if you've switched your machine into cardiac mode or not. Your image will be flipped to the left or the right, depending on which mode you select. The things we care about don't really change, as they're found along a vertical line down the middle, but just be aware. If you were to take this same image in abdominal mode, which I actually do recommend because it takes you time to change modes and we don't really have that kind of time in what we're doing, then you would notice that the base of the heart, with all of its valvular structures, off to the left of your screen, not to the right as it is currently. You can see this visually using the orientation dot at the top right of the image, marked by a little blue dot. Uh, it's off to the right of the probe, which indicates currently that it's in a cardiac orientation. The subxiphoid view to the right is very similar except that it is shot through the liver which peaks into view in the top left of the image. The right ventricle is still on top as always. The left ventricle is just below it, with the RA and the LA just deep to each ventricle. Uh, this view is the most sensitive for picking up pericardial effusions, so it's very good for a fast exam, but it may not provide as much cardiac detail as the parasternal view. For our purposes, though, either is usually fine, and you really should be comfortable with attaining both and interpreting both, as it's not uncommon for one view to be much easier to obtain in some patients than it is the other. When looking at the cardiac view, the things we care about depend on if we're doing a fast exam or a rush exam. Uh, the fast exam, there's only, only one thing we care about. Is there fluid between the heart and the pericardium? If there is, we need to be thinking about tamponade. We would find the fluid between the ventricle and the bright white line of the pericardium. Uh, be careful about finding fluid in the anterior surfaces. That could actually be a fat pad, and so you want to make sure that it goes completely around the heart into the posterior side as well. And notice, as we saw in the earlier pictures, the dark circle below the pericardium uh, in the center of this screen is actually the descending thoracic aorta. And we notice that if there were any fluid, which there's not, fortunately, in this picture, uh, it would be above the pericardium if it was a tamponade, and it would be behind the pericardium, closer to the descending thoracic aorta, if it was a pleural effusion and outside of the pericardium. If we were doing a rush exam, however, we would care about the fluid just like we would the FAST exam because the FAST is a component of the rush exam, but we would also be looking at total cardiac function. Uh, since the right heart, if it's larger than 50% of the total heart, it should be less than 40%. If it's larger than 50% of the total heart, we need to be thinking about the possibility of a pulmonary embolus. If a clot were to go into the lungs, it would prevent blood from flowing from the right heart through the lungs into the left ventricle. So we would see a left ventricle that appeared mostly empty and a right ventricle that was dilated. This can also happen in a couple other things like a long-standing COPD, but patients with COPD are also more likely to have PEs. So these are things we just need to worry about. Um, we can pass it on to an emergency physician and have them really uh, pull their hair out over it if they want, but these are things we need to be reporting. We also need to be looking at global heart function. If it's poor, we need to be thinking this could be heart failure. This is a patient that may or may not tolerate fluids too well. We'll go over a fluid status assessment in our upcoming videos on the rush exam because this is part of it, but it's just something to pay attention to. We can see on this heart everything looks to be squeezing quite well, so not too worried about that. To obtain the parasternal long axis view, we're going to place our probe essentially where 
our 12 lead marker V2 would be, and we will point the dot, the probe marker, off to the right towards the patient's shoulder. Um, we'll stay close to the sternum, and we can move up and down a few rib spaces with large motions until we find the heart. When you find the heart, place your little finger on the patient's chest to stabilize your hand, and you can start making small movements to refine your image. And be sure to save a clip when you see what you want. So we can see in this image, this is the video that was playing earlier, uh, we have a heart that is perfectly uh, in view right here. We have the right ventricle on the top. We have the left ventricle on the bottom. We can see the mitral valve moving quite well, the aortic outflow track. We can see the aortic valve. Everything seems to be moving well. I don't see an effusion. There's no black between the heart and the pericardium. Uh, everything is squeezing well. The right ventricle is definitely less than 50% of the size of the two ventricles combined. Everything looks pretty normal in this view, which is good because it's marked normal. Okay, so this is a little bit of a different case here. There is black outside of the left ventricle and in between the pericardium. So this would be a pericardial effusion. And when we look at how poorly that heart is contracting, I mean, the LV is barely moving at all. Uh, that does not look like a good heart. So that's probably why there's fluid backing up everywhere. So there's probably some sort of a congestive heart failure. It could be a liver failure, but this patient is generally sick just looking at this ultrasound. Would not want to have this patient in my ambulance. Okay, here's a great one here. So we have fluid around the heart. We can see it on the anterior side, and then we can see it on the posterior side of the heart as well. We can tell that it is inside the pericardium because you can see the descending thoracic aorta is outside of the fluid collection. It is not encompassed in the fluid collection. So this would be fluid around the heart, so it would be an effusion. But we can actually go one step further. When you see the wall, you see this free wall here, the right ventricle is bowing in during diastole. It's bowing in when it should be filling. That is a sign of tamponade. And this patient needs a needle in their chest now. To obtain the subxiphoid view, think about the probe like you're using an eye scooper. The way I'm holding it in this picture is unfortunately not the best way to hold it. But you try holding it with your thumb on top and digging it up under the xiphoid. This exam is often not terribly pleasant for the patient. It can help to be a little bit left of center as well, so you can use the liver as a better window. It also helps to increase your depth. The parasternal view is usually found at about 16 centimeters of depth, but the subxiphoid view often needs to be closer to 19 centimeters. Here's a normal subxiphoid view. Uh, just like the previous images, the right ventricle is the one that's on the top. We can see the liver that we're shooting our window through just to the top left outside of that. If we were to go back down, though, we have the intraventricular septum and the left ventricle just below it. We have the right atria and the left atria that you can see as well and the bright white line of the pericardium that's surrounding the heart. I don't see any free fluid here. Everything seems to be moving quite well, so I'd call this a normal exam. Again, good, because it's marked normal. Here's a little bit different case here. This heart has got black free fluid all around it, and we can see the bright white pericardium surrounding it as well. Uh, next thing we need to look for is how does that right ventricle free wall look in diastole? And as we can see here, as it's supposed to be getting large and filling up with blood, it's not. It's getting squeezed in. So this would be a high-pressure pericardium that's squeezing on the heart. This patient is in cardiac tamponade. We can guarantee that by looking at the ultrasound here. This would be another patient that needs a needle in their chest. The right upper quadrant view is obtained by placing the probe near the patient's flank with the marker towards their head. It can help to keep in mind that you're trying to image the kidney more than you are their liver, so you need to be fairly posterior. I often will say knuckles to cot to help reinforce this in my head when doing the exam. Once again, I'm holding the probe in this picture in a way so you can see where the marker would go, but I'd actually want my little finger to be closer to the patient's skin so that I can keep it from sliding around in the gel. When doing the right upper quadrant exam, it's good to have an idea what anatomy you're going to be looking at. There's multiple things we care about. The primary one is going to be the interface between the liver and the kidney. This is known as Morrison's pouch. The liver is a fairly free-floating organ compared to the left upper quadrant where we're going to have the spleen. The spleen's held down by multiple ligaments, so it's a little bit more difficult view. Fortunately, though, the liver is free-floating, and so whenever blood comes into the abdomen, it will actually kind of float up on top of the kidney, and you'll see black free fluid in a potential space called Morrison's pouch. To best identify this, we want to pan all the way through the kidney, both sides, when taking this image. A couple other things we can pay attention to when doing this is if we move towards the patient's feet, one or two rib spaces, we'll see something called the caudal tip of the liver, and that's noted at the top right of your screen. And you'll get that better into your view, 
And as we see that, that's actually the first place that free fluid is going to start to collect. If we move the probe up a few rib spaces towards the diaphragm, then we'll notice something at the bottom of the image. We'll see the spine, and the spine above the diaphragm should go away, and that's because the air in the lung should destroy this image. But if we can see the spine above the diaphragm, that means that there's actually fluid in the chest. And in a trauma patient, we have to assume that this is going to be a hemothorax, which is not good. So all these are little things to look for. And interestingly enough, the right upper quadrant view, you're going to find 50 to 60% of your free fluid in this view. It's a very, very important view to master. So here is a positive right upper quadrant exam. You have fluid in the chest here. Okay, So the fluid, you can see the spine extending above the diaphragm. You can see those little white squares with the shadows between them. Those are actually the vertebrae and the intervertebral discs. Uh, so you can see them above the diaphragm, so obviously there's no air there to destroy the image. It's fluid. In a medical patient, this can happen, but in a trauma patient, I would be very concerned. Here's a positive FAST exam. We have a very, very small amount of free fluid, this little bitty sliver of free fluid that we can see here. Regardless of how small that collection is, this is definitely something to note. It generally takes about half a liter of free fluid to collect for you to be able to see a positive FAST exam, even as faint as this one is. So if you were to see this one in the field 15 minutes after an accident, you've got to understand this patient has now bled out half a liter of blood into their abdomen in 15 minutes. That's not good. So this is definitely something to notice, even if it's small, it's something to be to pay attention to. This is a much larger collection of fluid. And this is one where I would definitely expect you to be able to pick this up. This collection of free fluid is, is much larger. This is definitely a positive FAST exam. And you call this one into the hospital and get them there as quickly as possible. Uh, this is an image that I took, actually. This is one of my patients. It was, uh, fell off the back of one motorcycle and was run over by another one. And we had this positive free fluid here. You notice it collected first in the caudal tip of the liver. So this is the most sensitive area in the right upper quadrant exam. In this case, we were able to call the trauma center and let them know that we were coming. They expedited their own FAST exam once we arrived. After performing the right upper quadrant view, we're going to perform a left upper quadrant view. It's important to keep in mind that this is not just the mirror of the right upper quadrant view. There are multiple ligaments, like I mentioned earlier, that hold the spleen in place. So while the liver will float up away from the kidney in a positive FAST exam, the spleen does not, and it can hide little pockets of fluid in various places. For this reason, it's very important to visualize the entire spleen and really pan all the way through the kidney when saving your image clip. Uh, the spleen is also smaller, and it's a less forgiving ultrasound target. So it's vitally important to keep uh, saying to yourself over and over, knuckles to cot, knuckles to cot. And this view, uh, you really get that probe posterior. I would want to have my hand back behind his arm if I was doing this exam. So again, this image that I took here is not exactly perfect, but it does give you a good idea of where to put your probe to begin with. So here's a positive left over quadrant view. We can see the spleen, which doesn't look exactly like the liver, but it looks close. We see the kidney. We see the space between the two, which is not Morrison's pouch. Uh, we can see the spine above the diaphragm, so there's going to be free fluid in the pleural space. And then we can see fluid below the diaphragm and between the spleen. So this would be positive peritoneal fluid. This is either a very bad trauma, or it could be a liver failure patient with cirrhosis, and they have fluid on both sides of the diaphragm. Uh, either way, uh, it's going to give you this positive image like this. Here's a video clip of the same image as we can see everything moving around. You notice the free fluid coming and going out of view with the patient's respirations. This is something to keep in mind that uh, as the patient breathes, you may or may not see things a little bit better. So sometimes asking them to take a breath can help bring things into view. The next view we'll do here is the suprapubic view. A short axis transverse shot and a long axis sagittal shot. Uh, this is going to be looking at the bladder and any of their pelvic organs. So on men, that's really going to be the seminal vesicles and the prostate. Both are pretty difficult to see. But on women, you're going to see a lot more. You're going to see the uterus, you're going to see the vagina, and sometimes the ovaries. This is important to keep in mind when you're doing a medical exam, like a rush exam, which we'll talk about later. But the medical exams, we can notice something like a ruptured ectopic pregnancy and things like this uh, sometimes. And you may even notice that the patient is pregnant, even if they didn't know they're pregnant when doing this exam. So this can be kind of a surprising little pelvic exam to do here. This is in a male patient here. As we notice, there are no female organs underneath the bladder. And we have a positive pelvic fast exam. In this view, you have free fluid on both sides of the bladder wall. So this would be a positive fast exam.
Okay. This is a positive fast exam in a short axis or transverse shot in a male patient as well. You have free fluid on both sides of the bladder wall. This is important to notice this because the seminal vesicles can look somewhat like this, but they're not going to be anywhere near that dark and they're not going to be that big either. Uh, that's the one downside to this pelvic view is that, especially in males, sometimes you can get some positives. Uh, you can get them a little bit in females as well. So the pelvic view can sometimes be a little bit trickier than the other ones. This is a very, very positive pelvic fast exam view in a female. That is actually the uterine and the suspensory ligaments of the uterus going off on either side. Um, there's free fluid all around all of these structures. Uh, to the point that this actually has its own name. Uh, for any Star Wars fans, you may see exactly what I'm talking about right away. We see this is called the TIE Fighter sign. So I already kind of mentioned this once before. It takes about half a liter of free fluid for anything to show up on ultrasound. So this means the average positive fast exam patient looks ill enough to be taken to a trauma center without question. At least they really should. Most of the ones I've dealt with had tire tracks or hoof prints on their abdomen, and that's really not an exaggeration. At a minimum, they're usually tachycardic, so to be surprised by a positive fast exam on a patient you had no intention of taking to a trauma center should be fairly rare. Essentially, this would be called an occult positive free fluid in the abdomen. You're talking about a patient that doesn't look injured, that doesn't appear in shock, but has bled half a liter of blood into their abdomen in the time it took EMS to arrive. I'm not going to say that a scenario like that wouldn't happen, but for a trauma patient to bleed half a liter in 20 minutes and not be showing outward signs or symptoms has got to be exceedingly rare. So rare, in fact, that it would probably be more likely to be a medical cause, possibly ascites from liver failure like I've mentioned before. In my opinion, the most common way to truly get a positive fast exam from trauma and not expect it is if you didn't know your patient was a trauma to begin with, in which case you wouldn't have done a fast because you only do fast exams on trauma patients. And therein lies the problem with the fast exam. I would bet nearly everyone who thinks about pre-hospital ultrasound thinks about it for its use in trauma. So that makes what I'm about to say sound almost blasphemous. The FAST exam is a virtually worthless exam in pre-hospital ultrasound and is distracting us and holding us back from actually changing pre-hospital care with ultrasound. I'm a bit biased because I've advised so many agencies starting EMS point of care ultrasound programs to not start with a FAST exam only to have them come back and say they're going to start with a FAST exam. The answer is often because it's easy and, well, that the right thing to do is rarely easy. That's the problem. The exam itself is just fine. The windows are great and they're used for so many things. What's wrong is the patient population that we're choosing to use this exam on and the way that we think about our findings. A positive fast exam is to trauma what a STEMI is to chest pain. It's a green light to go straight to the OR or the cath lab. Don't pass go, don't collect $200. But a negative fast exam is not analogous to a negative 12 lead. While the EMS 12 lead folks would likely argue correctly that a negative 12 lead doesn't mean the patient isn't having an MI, a negative fast exam is often interpreted as exactly that way, that the patient is not bleeding in their abdomen. The danger comes when this is interpreted to mean the patient is more stable than they appear, and therefore they don't need to go to a trauma center. I hear this all the time, people wanting to use the fast exam to triage patients going to trauma centers versus a local hospital. This is a terrible idea in which you're entering an absolutely no-win situation. One of my first fast exam uses was a teenage girl who was stepped on by a horse. She was in pain, it appeared likely to have broken ribs. Her vitals were a little bit shocky, but they could have also been that way due to pain. It's easy to convince yourself of these things when you have ultrasound, unfortunately. Our trauma center was about 40 minutes away, but the closest hospital was only 15 minutes away in the other direction. Mom preferred to go to the closest hospital, but if we'd pushed, we could have easily taken her to the trauma center. Instead, we performed a fast exam. Because we had these brand new ultrasound machines, we could determine all kinds of things like this. The fast exam was negative, so we transported her to the local hospital. They were not terribly pleased with us bringing her there, but hey, we had rolled out intra-abdominal bleeding with our new fast exam, so it was safe. One CT scan later, and she was on a $20,000 helicopter ride to the trauma center. Fortunately, she was discharged within a day or two without the need for surgery, but no matter what, we look like idiots. Didn't matter that the ED fast was also negative. The people that will get you in trouble don't care that it takes half a liter of free fluid for the fast exam to be positive. They care that we didn't take the patient to the right place, which once you've stripped all the extraneous things away, in the end, that's the only reason we exist. Even if we tried to make the best case scenario where we attempt to trend a fast exam to create data points. For instance, if the fast exam is negative in the field, but positive in the ED, that should mean the patient is actively bleeding, right? But how many times have you had a positive 12 lead in the field 
and a negative one in the ED after nitro, aspirin, fluids, and oxygen, only to have the ED question if your patient was actually having a STEMI in the field to begin with. And they're holding your 12 lead in their hand. This is not the fault of any ED in particular, because it's unfortunately human nature to assume the simplest thing, which is not that your patient is actively bleeding, and that's why they had a negative fast in the field, but positive one now. No. Unfortunately, the easiest thing is to assume what you want to assume, that those paramedics are trying to do ultrasound in the field, and they didn't do the exam correctly. Sure, this is something that we corrected with combined training and so on, but I'll tell you, it's something that ED docs face when dealt with a negative ED fast but a positive CT scan. The surgeons don't care that it takes half a liter of fluid to make a fast positive. They just want to know if they need to operate or not, and they don't like conflicting data messing with their head. So if ED docs have to deal with it, EMS will too, and it can really turn into one giant steamy pile of poo ripe for us to step in. We like to think about patients in groups, i.e. trauma patients, medical patients, OB patients, but sometimes all we have are sick and not sick patients. Occasionally in EMS, we have so little information up front that it may take the whole transport to even get oriented to which organ system has gone wrong. These are the patients where ultrasound can help the most. I like to call them undifferentiated sick patients. Think about this case. You have a 23-year-old Spanish-speaking female who complains of excruciating lower lo left quadrant pain that started the last few hours. You don't speak much Spanish. You're able to get that she's been vomiting for the last few days and that she appears sweaty and tachycardic on exam, but that's really it. She's obviously ill and she deserves transport to the hospital, but is she just dehydrated with a bad GI bug? Or is this something worse? You could palpate the abdomen, but without being able to tell her to relax, she could make her abdomen rigid just from pain alone. Bowel sounds won't tell you anything, and your EKG is just going to show you tachycardia. This is a patient where the only tool in EMS currently that can figure out what's going on is ultrasound, and it's rarely taught to be used in this kind of patient. Even for the few agencies that currently have ultrasound, most of them would leave it in the bag for this patient because she isn't a trauma. I had this very patient when I started in EMS. My EMT partner thought it was nothing and wanted to take the call. Fortunately, I had this little sixth sense going on, I guess, enough to figure that the patient at least needed an IV and some fluids. When we got to the hospital, they placed her in triage with the intent of pulling her IV and sending her out to the waiting room. Obviously, they agreed with my EMT. When she was moved from our stretcher to the chair, however, that's when she promptly turned pale, became even more diaphoretic, and passed out right as her automatic blood pressure cuff read 60 over 40. She was rushed to the, to the resuscitation room where bedside ultrasound showed free fluid in the abdomen. This ended up being a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, and I had completely missed it. Before you think that's okay, though, let me remind you that ruptured ectopic pregnancy is the leading cause of death in first trimester pregnancy. So if you want to do the ultrasound to find people that need to go to the OR, these are the people that need to go to the OR. The ironic part is that all it took to identify this was something that you now know how to do, essentially just a fast exam, but you're using it not in a trauma patient. So having a structured ultrasound protocol for the undifferentiated sick patient would have caught that this patient had a surgical emergency and required immediate triage to the resuscitation room. She was perilously close to being placed in the waiting room where she would have potentially bled out internally and died. This mass misclassification of a patient is something that ED worries about a lot when admitting a patient. The ED operates on limited information and must make a diagnosis quickly, so it should be thought that these are sometimes a shaky working diagnosis, and that's all they are. But thanks to the way our brains work, it doesn't always work that way. When the ED admits someone with chest pain to the cardiac floor, not infrequently investigation of other possible causes of the pain stop for at least the next 24 hours if they ever resume. Hopefully any misdirection is caught quickly, but it's not always done that way. Sometimes the ED diagnosis, whether right or wrong, sticks with the patient throughout their stay, only to be discovered when the patient comes back to the ED a week later and much sicker, much like my diagnosis did. I thought she had viral gastritis, so the triage nurse did too. This little bit of misdirection is very difficult to avoid in our daily practice, but having a structured ultrasound protocol to use for all of your sick patients can help cut down on this some. That's where the FAST exam excels at being a structured ultrasound exam. It just needs to be adapted for medical patients too. So going back to this original graphic on everything EMS ultrasound can do, let's adjust a few things. This is the way I want you to think about the FAST exam going forward. There's nothing wrong with the exam itself. It's actually an important part of the rush exam and is the common pathway that nearly every clinician learning point-of-care ultrasound starts off learning. But the rush exam is where our money is at. 
This is what will help the majority of our patients, and it's rarely emphasized for pre-hospital ultrasound. The problem is that the good old FAST exam has a lot of baggage in the way we think about it. Every benefit that can be gained from the FAST exam can be gained from the RUSH exam, and then some, all without the mental baggage associated with it. There is no impetus to get the patient to the OR faster and that your exam was useless if that doesn't happen. Instead, there is a goal of determining clinically relevant things, like if they need fluid or blood products, or if they need needle decompression before you innovate them. There is a focus of using your ultrasound technology on the unknown patients where they will do the most good, not the known patient where negative fast can provide false confidence that they're not as sick as they look. But I'm a realist. I understand my own words and experiences don't change the world and that the FAST exam will not simply go away. So my suggestion is you, to you is this. When you adopt ultrasound in your system, as the news spreads throughout your receiving hospitals and you inevitably come under the expectation, especially from non-EM clinicians, to perform the FAST exam, it is at this time you work on shaping these expectations of a field FAST exam protocol. Shaping them so you are not expected to triage. So that there's nothing wrong with calling an indeterminate FAST exam and so that there are no repercussions from calling a negative FAST exam that later becomes positive, should you even choose to include the negative option in your vernacular, which is an option for you as well to never call a negative FAST exam. This can actually be an opportunity to work closer with your hospital. It eventually did become that way for us as well. This is why I can't wait to go over the RUSH exam with you next lecture, and that's not to mention the many other things ultrasound can do for us. In the upcoming modules, we'll discuss the RUSH exam, fluid status assessment, lung ultrasound, IV access, ICP monitoring, and more. I will continue to share my tips on how to avoid the problems we faced in establishing our program and hopefully help you build yours along the way as well. If you have any questions, concerns, or comments, please feel free to direct them to me on the Twitters at Texas Prehospital and be sure to check out our group at www.emspocus.com for continued updates, conferences, and resources related to EMS point-of-care ultrasound. Thanks for watching. Be safe out there.